Uh, but in general, everything we say links with what we've just heard. Tao um, showed this by using a corpus, that the words that people use to start their turns are words which relate to what has just gone before. So we thought we would investigate this in uh, uh, various bits of data to see whether this is actually true, and especially to see how learners um, rise to this challenge. Here are two words that um, are very common. They're two of these small words in English, well and right. They're up there very high in the um, frequency lists of the spoken corpus. And, you know, it's very easy to count frequency with a corpus, with a computer. But it's not terribly interesting. It doesn't tell you very much. Far more interesting is to actually ask yourself the question, well, where do these words occur in people's turns? What, what do we do with these words, and where do we do it? Not just what do they mean, but where do we use these words? The computer shows that well loves to be number one word in your turn. It doesn't like at all, or very rarely, likes to be number three, number four, or number five word when you open your mouth. Now, this little particular computer program, the algorithm that produces these statistics, it, it was produced, um, I have to acknowledge, the help of Dr. Paula Buttery from the University of Cambridge, who helped me with this work, and who was, she is part of um, the English Profile Project. Very easily and very automatically, we can say when native uh, users of English speak and they use the words well and, and, and right, well loves to be first. Right also loves to be first. They're pretty similar. The curves are a little bit different. Right is a little more tolerant of being second. But generally speaking, these words love to be there first of all. Another word which is very frequent, another one of these little words which is very frequent is the word basically. Okay. Basically, basically, well, basically. If we do our well again, we, there, there's the line for well, you remember. Well loves to be first. When we look at basically, we have quite a different line. And we find that basically loves to be, most of all, loves to be second. Now you're thinking, good heavens, all these years and people have said, I've got to teach functions, I've got to teach notions, I've got to teach... Now they're going to say you've got to teach where you've got to say your words, you know. It's yet another bolt-on extra to the, to the busy life of the teacher. But don't be alarmed, because this, <laughs> this is just the empirical research. What comes out of it could be something much simpler. With this kind of research, we can establish, if you like, a turn grammar for English, a turn construction grammar. We can specify the conditions under which people construct their turns, how they build their speaking turn, and how they build it so that it links with what they've just heard and creates this kind of flow. So we can say, OK, well, what do learners do at the beginning of their turns? And we can very easily look at a native speaker corpus if we want to and find out what the favorite words are for opening people's turns. We can do the same with learners. Now, just because I don't want to go into the figures here, the really interesting thing about those two graphs is that the curves are fairly similar. They're not that different, actually. But some of the words are different. Some of the words that learners like to begin their turns with are not in the native speaker um, lists. But this is not because learners are poor imitation native speakers. It's very easy to trace the learner list back to the tasks that the learners are given in the oral examination. So if you take a word like because, why do learners love to begin their turns with because? It's because we're always asking them why. <laughs> we're always asking them, why are you here? Why are you learning English? Why are you doing this exam? Explain yourself. And defend yourself. Poor old learner is always having to say, because I want to get a good job, because I want to open a language school, because English is important in my country. We're, we're sort of asking them to do things that um, we might not necessarily demand so much of, of other speakers. So the big lesson we take from this is you can't isolate this kind of data from the tasks that the learners are being asked to do. I want to hop on 
to a real bit of data. Here's a bit of data. It doesn't matter if you can't read this from the back, because I'll read it out loud. This is a task from KET, the key English test, which is approximately A2 level, European um, uh, reference. And the task is, ask the other candidate five questions about her breakfast. <laughs> Use the pictures and the words given. Do it all the time. Ask people five questions about their breakfast. What's wrong with that? Perfectly a normal thing to do. Ask the other person five questions. Try it tomorrow morning. <laughs> and this is the conversation. These are two young, um, two young Albanian female students in Tirana, Albania, doing the exam. And the first one says, uh, when do you have breakfast? I have my breakfast at um, 7 o'clock. Where do you have breakfast? Uh, in my kitchen, in my house. In what room? In the kitchen. And do you have coffee or tea for breakfast? Uh, tea. What do you eat? A toast and a cup of tea. How many times a day do you have it? <laughs> uh, uh, two, two times. Two times. <laughs> then there is an agonizing pause of four seconds, complete silence. And don't forget, this is a room with two candidates and an examiner. And for four whole, horrible, long seconds, nobody knows what to say. And then after four seconds, the brighter, obviously the brighter of the two students says, sorry, I don't understand you. Repeat the sentence, please. How many times a day do you have breakfast? One time a day, of course. <laughs> now, this is a good laugh, yes. It's great, you know, every speaker has to have their little gem of data that they bring along to a conference, and this is mine. But it does strike me that What's, what's going on here is it is simply bound to end up as, as an interrogation, something like a police interrogation. It is bound to end in this way. Therefore, it is highly unlikely that it will produce that kind of linking and flow that we get. The data is not without that kind of flow. As you go up the levels, you do find the students are beginning to do this because the task is becoming more natural, more interactive. So I'm going to stop there because I just wanted to give you a taste of where the research is going, the kinds of things that we're doing on the English Profile Project, not because we want to see how, how uh, poor or pathetic learners are, but we want to find out exactly what it is that learners do when they use language in these different settings, in the classroom, in the workplace, in the examination room, how those things relate to the tasks that we give them, and whether by having better tasks, we actually enable learners to, to do what we want them to do, so that terms like uh, fluency, speed, ease, spontaneity, lack of silences, and so on, can actually happen. Thank you very much indeed.